In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Just a few details about Our Lady's birth and heritage to begin. Mary was born both of the tribe of Judah and of the family of David. We know from sacred scripture that Christ was of the family of David. For the Jews said to him in Jerusalem, Hosanna to the son of David. And the angel said to Mary, and the Lord shall give him the throne of David his father. But this Davidic origin can only arise from our Blessed Lady. For we know that Saint Joseph was not the physical father of our Blessed Lord, but that he proceeded in that sense only from our Blessed Lady and the Holy Ghost. So that means that our Blessed Lady had to be of the house of David in order for our Lord to be of the house of David. It is also true that the Jews had to marry within their own tribe and their own family. But Joseph was of the house of David, as is clear from the gospel today. So that means Our Lady also had to be of the house of David because she could not marry outside of her own house and her own tribe. Mary was also of priestly stock. It was permitted for the members of the tribe of Levi to marry out into the royal line. Why was this true? The, tri the tribe of Levi was the tribe that was assigned to the care of the temple, and they could not hold any land in the Holy Land. Only the other tribes could. And the other tribes had to give 10% of their income in order to support the Levi, the tribe of Levi. That's where we get the term tithe, which comes from the word meaning 10%. So because they could not own land, they could marry into the royal line. And hence we read that Elizabeth was her kinswoman, that is her cousin. Elizabeth was married to Zachary, who was a priest in the temple, therefore of the tribe of Levi. Moses and his brother Aaron were of the tribe of Levi, and the priesthood of the Jews descended from Aaron. So if you were born to the tribe of Levi, you were automatically a priest because you descended from Aaron. Mary's parents were Joachim and Anne, as we know. The identity of Saints Joachim and Anne are attested to by Saint John Damascene. <clears throat> he lived in the 700s and he wrote down all of the traditions concerning the Blessed Virgin Mary. And we have other real reliable authors from the early times who attest to the identity of Saints Joachim and Anne. They were probably poor due to the fact that Our Lady could find no room at the inn if she had had money, if she were wealthy, she could have somehow found something that was suitable, but she had nothing to offer, so they went to the stable. And she married a carpenter. If she had been wealthy, she would have married into probably a wealthy family but she married a carpenter, and at the presentation of our Lord in the temple, Our Lady and Saint Joseph gave only turtle doves, which was permitted only to the poor to offer as an offering. <clears throat> and Saints Joachim and Anne were renowned for their holiness and piety, which of course makes perfect sense. And also Saint Anne was sterile this is an ancient and constant belief of the faithful. And in that she is like Sarah in the Old Testament who gave birth to Isaac in her 90th year and after she had been sterile for all of that time. And Anna who was the mother of Samuel, the first of the judges of Israel, she was also sterile. And Elizabeth 
who was married to Zachary, but who was also sterile her whole life, but also in her old age. And she conceived of and gave birth to St. John the Baptist. And those are three very important people in the Old Testament leading up to the time of Christ. <clears throat> the birth of Our Lady was also foretold to St. Joachim. St. Epiphanius, living in the fifth century, said, we know from the history of Mary and from tradition that it was announced to Joachim, her father, in the desert. And St. John Damascene also mentions this. You should know that Our Lady was conceived naturally by her parents. There was no supernatural intervention there. And the birth of Our Lady did not inflict pain upon St. Anne. Pain in childbirth, one of the most extreme pains that human beings can bear, is the result of original sin if you read Genesis. If you notice, that pain does not occur in animals. Animals get a little uncomfortable, but they don't go through terrible pain when they are bearing a child. And one has to ask the question, why, if it is a perfectly natural thing to bear a child, is there so much pain? Pain being the sign of disorder. Why is there so much pain in human beings? And the reason is original sin. So our Blessed Lady, free from original sin, did not in any way give pain to St. Anne, just as our Blessed Lord did not give in any way pain to our Blessed Lady when she bore him. So sometimes you see these films showing our Blessed Lady in the pains of childbirth. That is entirely false. The principal joy of this feast is that it marks the beginning of the re-creation of man. Mankind fell through the curiosity, pride, and disobedience of the first woman. Now, the men should not take any sort of credit for that, because original sin descends to us not from the woman but from the man. And he was just as guilty as she. But nonetheless, she started it by her curiosity, her pride, and her disobedience. Consequently, it is fitting that the recreation of man should begin with a woman, as if to redeem by her wisdom, her holiness, her obedience, her humility, all that was lacking in our first mother. In the first creation, God drew Eve from Adam. But in the second creation, God will draw the new Adam from the new Eve. Again, that the recreation should start from a woman. By new creation or recreation, we mean that man, through the redemption by Christ's blood, is restored to the original grace which he had in, the par in paradise before the fall. He was created in the state of sanctifying grace. And by the dispensation of God, man was meant to communicate not only his human nature to his children, but also his supernature, that is, supernatural grace to his children. That grace would be communicated that way. Friendship with God would be communicated through generation. With the fall, what is communicated is original sin, that is, enmity with God, and all that flows from original sin. And this is why the sacrament of baptism is called rebirth. Our Lord said to Nicodemus that you have to be born again, referring to the sacrament of baptism. For after the fall, mankind was incapable of remaining morally good for a long time. 
He was capable of some natural virtues, and we see these natural virtues in some of the ancient pagans, particularly the virtue of justice, which is the easiest of all of the natural virtues, to render to others what is due to them. So even today, even very sinful people are fundamentally just. They pay their debts. They are civilly acceptable. But it is the teaching of the church that man cannot for a long time persevere in virtue without actual grace, that he will eventually fall into mortal sin. He will be bad. And we see this in our own society, a society without grace for the most part, not because God does not give it or want to give it, but because human beings have rejected it. They have known the Messiah. They have known the Savior. They have heard about him, and now they reject him. So the condition of the world after Christ, rejecting him after Christ, is far worse than the condition of the world not knowing Christ. And the sins of this age are far greater because they are more deliberate after Christ has revealed himself and after he is known as the savior of the world. So in that sense, this is the worst of all ages. And we see what is happening around us. It is scary when we see what the radical left would like to make of our lives. I just saw a picture of the vice president of the United States with his wife, standing next to the prime minister of Ireland with his male partner. A hundred years ago, that would have been considered in the British Isles, all over the world, the most horrid and outrageous scandal. But there he was. And, and that sin is not just a, a sin of impurity. It is a revolt against nature. That is why it is so bad. It's not simply weakness. It is a revolt against nature. And the fact that it is accepted by society is the ultimate revolt against nature, ultimately the revolt against God himself. And we see other things. We see what they call drag queens going around to kindergartens and first grade. These are men that dress up in women's clothing, which sacred scripture calls an abomination. And they are invited into public schools to read books to the children. And courses are given to little children in order to educate them to be tolerant of these things, to be diverse, and not to identify with any one gender. This is really, really evil. This is evil beyond anyone's conception. And who knows what the future brings? There are millions and millions of these people. They are in our government, and, and they, they are running for office. This is not some little crazy sect. And so we see the world sinking into the effects of original sin very, very swiftly and alarmingly. We just don't know what is in store for us in the future. Indeed, it will not be long, I don't think, before we see the days of Antichrist, because all of the world, it seems, is prepared for him. <clears throat> Those who did lead good moral lives before the redemption of Christ on Calvary did so with the assistance of actual grace. But that grace was granted in anticipation of the redemption of Christ on Calvary. That grace was the grace of Christ. There was no grace given to men except through Christ, and there is no grace given to men except through Christ. That's why it is a blasphemy against our Lord Jesus Christ himself to say that the Jews have their own way to God, that the old law for them is still valid, as Ratzinger said, John Paul II said, and which is repeated. 
as if they are not in need of the redemption of Christ, of the blood of Christ. That is a blasphemy, it is a heresy, yet this is what the Novus Ordo teaches. The grace of Christ, this actual grace, which is a movement of our wills, both firm and gentle, because it does not in any way take away our free will. To make us think the right things, to make us do the right things, to do good and to avoid evil, to avoid the occasions of sin, it is absolutely necessary for eternal salvation. We could not do it without it, without this assistance from God guiding us to himself at all times. We receive actual grace many, many times a day. And it comes to us both in the intellectual order and the practical order, what to do now, what we should do, what our duties are to God, And it is most precious to us since it is the basis of our eternal salvation. It is as precious to us as a rope if we were at the bottom of a well, a rope sent down to us in order to save us. It is as precious to us as a lifeboat when the ship is sinking. For this reason, the nativity of Our Lady is particularly joyful to us because it is the beginning of our salvation. But her birth, and even the birth of Christ, is not sufficient for our salvation. It is not sufficient that our blessed Lord have the same nature as us. This was something preached by John Paul II that all men are in a certain way redeemed by simply the fact that Christ became man. We have to become attached to him. What is necessary is that he offer himself in a bloody expiation of our sins and that this blood be applied to us so that we may obtain its effects And this blood is applied to us by means of baptism, which St. Paul says is a participation in the passion and death of Christ. Water takes the place, actually, of pouring blood on the child. It is is a sign by which the, the soul is cleansed by the blood of Christ, an efficacious sign, accomplishing that cleansing. That is how we are attached to the Redeemer. And baptism is only the beginning. The Christian life requires that we participate in Christ's expiatory sufferings by the bearing of our crosses every single day. Our Lord said it. Take up your cross daily and follow me, every single day. So this world in which we live is defined by the cross of Christ. For this reason, the central act of worship of Christ's church, which is the Roman Catholic Church, is the reenactment of his passion and death at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The passion and the death of Christ must be the constant focus of the human race in order that it be saved. Our Blessed Lady, for her part, although completely innocent of sin, will participate in this expiation by her interior crucifixion, which is the kind of crucifixion that most of us go through. 
not being called to a bloody martyrdom. We call this her transfiction. That is, it is the sword that will pierce her heart, as Simeon said to her. This is it, watching her son go through his agony. And why was that her transfiction? Because her love was so strong and so pure for her son, so supernatural, that, as St. Bernard said, there was not a single suffering that attained our Lord that did not go first through her. And we celebrate this transfiction of our Blessed Lady, this interior crucifixion next Sunday, the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows. By this participation in his crucifixion, in this sacred act of expiation for sin, she will become an intimate associate of her divine son in the salvation of mankind. So this child that is born today is destined to be associated with our Lord in this grand act of expiation and of redemption. For it is not enough that the blood of Christ ran down upon the hill of Calvary, it must also run into our souls and it does so by the justification received at baptism and by actual graces and sanctifying grace. As the mother of mercy, she will attract countless millions, billions of souls over the ages to her son. She will be so easy to approach, even for the hardened sinner, and by approaching her, nothing else could happen except that you are led to her son. So she has this tremendous role in the work of salvation. And that is why she is so venerated in the Catholic Church. Not as simply a good woman like the mother of Samuel, Anna, or Sarah, the mother of Isaac, a good woman who bore an important child but as an intimate associate in what is so important to us, our salvation. And Protestants do not understand the theological depth of the devotion to the Virgin Mary, why it exists and what it's all about. They simply do not understand it and they accuse us of worshiping her as if she is a god, which is a lot of nonsense. The birth of the Blessed Virgin Mary is the long-awaited fulfillment of the prophecy made to the devil by God after the fall of man. He said, I will put enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed. She shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. And this day, the nativity of the Virgin Mary, is the declaration of war upon the devil who dragged us into sin. We rejoice, therefore, on this holy feast, not only for the life, this new life of the Blessed Virgin Mary, as we would rejoice for any little baby that came into the world, not only for that, but more so for the new life that grace will give to us. We rejoice for ourselves, even more than we rejoice for our Blessed Lady. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.